Yeah. You say that, then you should. You're stuck with what you say. His theoretical work is grounded in the way we use it as applied folks. Um, and so I just like to say, I, I certainly want, I mean, Desiree is, is his own person, um, but in some of you young people might not remember, but um, CPC was fortunate enough to have uh, folks like David Gilkey and Tom Mraz um, who were applied or were microeconometricians themselves. Um, who just did great, had great partnerships with the folks at CPC on research. And, um, and I think Desiree is very, he's got, he loves to look at applications in labor and health and education. And so I think there might be some similar synergies uh, with his work as a CPC fellow um, and, his, and his research in theoretical economics. So anyway, and then the other thing I'll just add is, I, I've only seen Desiree present twice, but he's, a, no, three times now, but he's um, an excellent presenter. I mean, like, I understand, like, the hard theory stuff, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I see in my data, and he helps me to really understand things, so I hope that you'll get the same feeling after today. Go ahead, Denver. Thank you, thank you very much, and now you, you put me on the pressure. <laughs> So yeah, I'm glad to have done as my chair. I mean, I hope you stay in the chair next year. So right. yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, I'm Desiree Vidani and I do work on causal influence program evaluation. Uh, I try to look at both theoretical and applied side. Okay. So this this work is a paper uh, with a, a former student of mine from Iowa State. He's now at uh, RIT in the finance department. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about robust difference in differences models. Okay. How many of you have heard about difference in differences models? Oh, oh great. So <laughs> okay. So now what I'm going to do is usually if, if you think about causal inference. Did did, yeah. did he show you how to turn the volume on and stuff? I assume everybody can hear us. Uh, Maybe. Uh, three, three, okay. uh, yeah, it's already on. Okay, it's unmuted. Okay, sorry. So, if you think about program evaluation, causal inference in general, the main issue is how do you get counterfactual quantities? Suppose that I want to measure the effect of a, a new policy, like suppose Congress passed a law, okay, the infrastructure bill, and you want to look at the effect of that on employment, for example. Okay. So now since the law is passed, you can look at the, the, the current employment, average employment, given that the law is already passed. But the issue is, what the, given that the law is passed, if you don't have the counterfactual, if the law was not passed, what would be the employment level? Because if you had that, then you just take the difference between the employment level now that the law is passed minus what would be the employment level if the law was not passed. But you don't have that. So usually, that's the counterfactual. If you get the counterfactual, then you are done with a causal inference program evaluation. So here I'm going to kind of denote by uh, this Y. One is like the outcome, the employment level if someone is treated, okay? If the law is passed. Then the Y zero would be the employment level if the law is not passed. Now we want to look at the effect on that on the treated population, which is D equal to one given that the law is passed. So we need a control group if we want to do that. Maybe let's use Canada, for example, compared to the US, right? So usually, even if you think about in the absence of the law, employment rate in Canada is different from employment rate in the US, even without the law, right? So that difference already existed. So that's kind of the selection bias, right? Because there was no issue, it, no program, no law in the US about infrastructure up here, but there was already a difference between Canada and the US. So that difference, usually we attribute that to the selection, right? Because there is a, some, there are some uh, idiosyncratics, right? But shock variables that are specific to the US, right? So basically, if we can identify the counterfactual, then we, we are kind of done with causal inference. So if I give you a data on Y variable employment, and then I give you data on people who are treated, people who are not treated, you can always take the difference in main outcomes between the treated and control group. 
right? The question is, can you interpret that as a causal effect, right? How can you interpret that? If it's like you're running a regression, right? So in economics, we say that the treatment may be endogenous in the sense that some people may select maybe because they have some perspective about the gain that they may have from the treatment. If that the case, then the simple difference in names cannot, cannot be interpreted as a total effect. So, but the goal standard has been that you just randomize. If you can randomly assign people to treatment and control group, then you can take the difference, same difference in names between the treated group and control group, right? But sometimes you can randomize and the subject, they don't comply with the assignments, with the experiments, okay? Think about this. It, well, there was an experiment in uh, a paper in econometric, which is a top journal in economic, uh, economics. So there was a, an experiment about uh, deworming, like kids are sick and then they give them drugs to get them treated. So they were randomly assigned to the treatment and control group. Some, people, some kids, they, they received the drug, some did not. But now kids who received the drug, they did not drink it, they took it, they kept it, and then they pass it to the friends who are in the control group. In such a case, even if you are able to randomize, there is imperfect compliance. So you can no longer interpret simple difference as the causal effect, okay? So even in some situations, randomization is not possible because of budget constraint, costly, okay? And for some ethical reasons, you cannot randomize. Like I cannot randomly assign people to the uh, to take the vaccine if they don't want, okay? Or you cannot randomly assign, for example, education. Say you get the PhD, you get the bachelor, you cannot do that, right? And even if you are able to do that, sometimes we worry about external validity. Can I generalize that the same experiment, the conclusion to another setting, another population, right? So there have been many approaches in uh, economics and social sciences, and difference in differences is one of them. Regression discontinuity design or instrumental variables or matching. So today I'm going to talk about different diff. So the question is, when you use a different approach, other than the all have diff, simple difference in means, then these approaches must be imposing some restrictions on the level of selection, the bias actually. Okay, what kind of restriction do this approach impose on the selection? So if we understand that. We, we're going to say, okay, we have a restriction on this relation. Do this restriction make sense, right? So that's why we're going to look at now in the case of different day, how do we interpret this kind of restriction? What is the restriction that difference in differences is imposing on this relation bias? Okay, so this, this, this method relies on the so-called parallel trend assumption. Basically, it's, it's like, if I take the, the infrastructure bill example, and then I want to compare the US to Canada, before the law was passed, you see Canada and the US, you see the employment rates. You can compare the trend. If they follow similar trend, the level is different, right? But if at least you see that over the years, the trends are parallel, then that tells you that, okay, in the absence of the infrastructure bill, they will have followed the same trend. And that's how we can use this approach to kind of back out the causal effect. But if you see that the trends were already different, then you cannot believe that if somehow in the absence of the treatment, they will have the same trend, which is the key assumption that the method relies on, okay? So usually what people do, they're going to look at the pre-treatment period and see if the trends were already parallel. But this is not an actual test, okay? So this is, Authors, they are very famous in different, different literature, Carlo and Santana. So they said that this is just a pretest. It's different from an actual test. So comparing the trend before the treatment of the, the, the bill was passed, it's just a pretest. It, you do it to feel good about what you are doing, but it's not a, a, like a, an implication, a testable implication. Okay? So, but they said that we said we view this as a piece of evidence of the credibility of the assumption. So we do that to make sure that we, something is, what we are doing makes sense, okay? So the question I'm trying to, we are trying to answer this paper is, what if you don't see parallel trend in the pre-treatment period? What if the trends are not parallel? 
how can you be robust to the violation of such assumption? Okay, so we are going to propose a method that will be robust to the violation of the parallel train. So how are we going to do that? Basically, parallel train, okay, is it just a device for us to remove the bias from the pre-treatment period. As I was saying, Canada and the US, they were already different before the bill was passed. That kind of bias. So when we say the trends are parallel, it's like the difference is constant over the difference between Canada and the US is already constant over the years. That's the selection bias. So now, next period, I'm going to say, okay, my if I take the simple difference in means, it will be equal to the true causal effect that I care about plus this bias. Then I take the difference that I've seen before, we'll remove that from that difference in means, and say, okay, because I get the bias from the pre-treatment period, when I do that, I remove the bias. But if I don't have that. So this is all conditional on the X's too, right? Yes. So, I mean, there's some observable X's that might be different between US and Canada that might explain those differences. Yes. And so you're talking about that unobserved. Yeah, that's right. So I'm assuming that you condition all variables that you can observe. Okay, so you can condition the population, the the uh, the number of people, for example, who are active in the population. Anything that you may condition on uh, between Canada and the U.S. But what I'm talking about is the unobserved selection that they they select on something that you don't observe. That's how you control for that. That the, what the parallel trend does. Condition on any variable that you may observe. Okay. We're going to abstract from that, assuming that continue condition on that. Thank you, Donna. So what the as uh, there are existing papers that have looked at this. What they do, they kind of look at trend. As I was saying, if the trends are not parallel, okay, they're going to say, let's allow for some deviations from the trend, okay, from the parallel trend. Then you need to control for the amount of deviation, right? That you need. So that kind of you need to choose. You as the researcher, you need to choose the amount of deviation you want to allow. And sometimes there is no uh, agreement about how much you want to allow. People can cheat and say, OK, I want my result, result to be precise, so I'm going to tolerate this amount of deviation. Okay, What we are going to do here will be kind of free of that. You will let the data give you this kind of amount of selection. So basically, what we're going to do is simple. We're going to compare all the periods before okay, the bill was passed and look at the difference between US and Canada. Okay, We see these differences over the years. And we say, OK, this, this gives us the set of possible biases that we can have. And we're going to make the assumption that in the absence of the law, the set was going to be stable. So the set of biases that we have seen before is going to be stable over the, the year. So meaning that the next period selection bias will be within the set that we have seen before. Okay, so that will be the main assumption. So we call that the selection based realization of the parallel trend. So if we think about parallel trend, the issue is about selection. It's not about trend. Actually, we don't care about the trend. We care about whether there is a selection problem, okay, which we call endogeneity in economics. So feel free to ask questions like Donald. So if anyone has questions, I will have it. So what we're going to look at here, the main assumption in a parallel trend is kind of saying that the selection bias in the pre-treatment period is equal to the selection bias in the post-treatment period. That's what the standard parallel to a diff and diff assumption assumes. Okay. So the bias is constant over the years. But now if you, if you see that the biases that you had before the treatment happens, they are not the same, then this assumption is violated. Right? You cannot trust that anymore because the bias is changing over the year. What do you do? So as I was saying, the main assumption is like the set of biases is stable over the years. Instead of saying that the bias is the same every period, the set is going to be the same. Okay. So and then I'm going to talk about the method and show you some empirical illustration, how you can see that in real data, how you can see that this, the bias is changing over the time. Okay. So let me skip. So you can see here that the, there is movement in this literature. So the papers that I cite here from 2019 to 2022, 
So this is a, 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 an area where you see a lot of movement in in the econometrics. It's a kind of some. It's there is some revolution going on here, and people are excited about that. But that's how I started working on it, and I think uh, I'm kind of. Uh, Getting to the point, I think there is no actually no revolution. It's just like <laughs> people understand what's going on, they will see that so it's, it's just the same thing that people have been doing. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to do here is like before the treatment happened. So let's I'm going to say the period zero is the, the baseline period. So there was not yes. And an earlier slide you had the term convex all, and yes. you're talking about the the value I think of the bias. Lying within the convex hall, I'm not an economist. Is that just is that just the distribution of the observed yeah, that's, biases during the pre-treatment period? Yeah, that's a great question. So I use the technical word convex hall. What it means is that the set of biases. You look at the minimum bias and the maximum bias. So here is going to be just the interval mm -hmm. defined by that. That gives you the set of possible biases that you can have if you look at the pre-treatment period. Yeah, that's the convex hall. Yeah. So the model, I'm going to try to not talk about, I mean, show a lot of math here, but sometimes you have to. <laughs> so let's look at the outcome variable. This will be like uh, unemployment rate, okay, in period zero, the baseline period where there was no infrastructure bid, okay? And because there was no infrastructure bid, we're going to say that it's the potential outcome, potential employment rate in the absence of the infrastructure bid. In the period zero, baseline period, nobody was treated. And then when we're in period one, we observe the new employment rates for the US. Okay, So we're going to look at, say, OK, if when the US passed the law, okay, for the US, that is going to be Y1 of 1. That's the new employment rate for the US. But I want to know Y1 of 0. If the US did not pass the law, what would be the employment rate? That's usually the counterparture that I don't know. Okay. So Y11 is kind of the current okay, employment rate given that the law is passed. And the Y1 of zero is the current employment rate given that the, if the law was not passed. Okay. So basically, we want to know what is the average employment rate due to this law. Okay. The difference in employment rate that the, the law brings, like now that. People are going to construct uh, roads, roads, and etc. Then, then we have employ some people, and that will increase employment. Right? Usually, that is the debate that people make the agreement for that. So we want to see if actually that increases employment. Right? So we want to look at the average for the U.S. D equal to one is the U.S. D equal to zero is Canada. So we want to focus on the U.S. So what we can show is you can actually write the simple orders which is the difference in means between Canada and the US, as equal to the two effect, the ATT plus the bias, okay? I was saying that we can no longer interpret the simple difference between the US and Canada as the causal effect, because there existed already a difference in the absence of the, the law. So it means that if I take the simple difference, it's equal to the true effect plus the bias. So the question, the main question is, how do I get this bias, right? If you tell me this is the bias, the bias is equal to 10, I come back here, I plug 10 in, and then I get the, the causal effect. So my whole question, what I'm trying to do is, where do I get this bias from? And the standard approach, if I randomize, suppose I randomly assign okay, the treatment, then by the size, this bias is going to be equal to zero. But the law is not randomly assigned, right? Because people, maybe they observe something, they say, okay, the roads are broken and we also need to create jobs, maybe we need to add, right? So it's not randomly assigned. Because of that, you have that bias. So what you want to do is, the parallel trend assumption usually will say, okay, the bias in period zero, where there was no law, is equal to the bias in period one. So if you, you replace the bias, which is just the simple difference between US and Canada, 
We are assuming here that there is no anticipatory effect of the, the treatment below. They, they didn't anticipate that. So the, the, what you see before was the bias in period zero. But if we assume that it's the same as the bias in period one, you come back to this equation here and then you replace this bias in period one by the, the bias in period zero. And then you are done. That's what the simple diff in diff does. Okay? So the diff in diff is just assuming that, okay, I do the difference in means in period, current period, I go back one period, and then I get that difference, I come here, I plug that in, and then I take the double difference, that the main difference in difference. Okay. But what if we don't see the, the bias are not equal? What we do? So that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to show you an example. Don't, don't look at this, but instead look at the picture here. I have a data, okay? Usually we have data in period, let's say we have two pre-treatment period, period minus one, period zero. And then the treatment happens in period one. So the, the red one is for Canada and the blue, the green one is, from the, is for the US. So if you look at that, when I plot the data like this, it seems like this difference here that I see in period minus one is the same as the difference I see in period zero. And then it's also the same as the difference I see in period one. So that suggests that the bias is constant over the time. Okay, so I can use different diff. Now think about where, when the bias is not the same here, okay? What if I, I want to relax the assumption following the trend, okay? What trend am I going to choose? Because here I don't have any trend. I just have data points. What we usually do, we plot the data point and we draw the lines between the data points. So we're kind of assuming that the trend is linear. But in this example, this is actually the trend. So if you have in mind that the trend is linear, then you want to look at deviation from that linear trend. By trying to correct, okay, to be robust, you can also mis misspecify the model because the actual trend is not linear. So our approach here will be robust to this kind of misspecification, okay? So what we do, we kind of define what we call generalized diff in diff, okay? What the, 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 uh, the, the approach does here, you take the same difference in means between Canada and the US, okay? And then you say, okay, I'm going to remove the bias from that. But I don't know the bias, but I'm going to define the set of biases. So if I know the set of biases, I will plug the set in instead of a single number. And when I do that, what I get as a, a result will be a set instead of a single value. So instead of getting a point, you're getting a set. And that set can be informative about the causal effect that you care about. Okay. So we kind of move a little bit from getting just a point and then we're getting a set. But that set can tell us meaningful information about the causal effect. If, for example, the lower bound is positive, that's telling us that employment increases, right? So it can tell something about the magnitude of the causal effect. But at the same time, we are trying to be robust. What if the parallel trend assumption is violated? What it can do? So we introduce this uh, notion of generalized diffusion. So suppose that I see I have three free treatment periods and all the biases are equal. Then I'm going to assume that next period the bias is going to be the same because I see it the same in the previous period. But if I see this, okay, none of the biases here is equal to the other one. So they're all different. So I'm not going to assume that the next period bias here will be equal to the previous one. That's what the parallel trend assumption does. But instead, I'm going to assume that the next period selection bias will be within the set that is defined by the previous biases. And if I do that, then I go back to that equation that I showed you, and then I plug the bias in. But what if I have this pattern, right? Obviously, the next period selection bias will not be within the set, right? The mean and the max, it will be outside that. So if you, you see the pattern, that's why you need to kind of look at the data. You let the data speak. 
If you see this, what you do, you focus the next period selection bias. Then you plot that back in the equation. Okay. So the idea is well, how do I get the bias from how do I get the bias and how where, where do I get it from? So you kind of listen to the data, you let the data speak, and then you see the pattern, then you try to follow that pattern and model the bias. Basically, it's like you want to find the determinants of the bias, and then you can predict the bias. Okay. So this is actual data. This is on a Brazil a data from Brazil. So in 2007, there was a, a law that was passed in Brazil to give municipalities the ultimate right to kind of supply water services to their communities. Okay. So usually there was before that, before the law it was a, there was a conflict between the federal level, the government, and then the municipalities about who can who has the right to supply water to the communities. And the crash it's a paper in AG policy in economics. So he he was his question was that maybe because there was this conflict, municipalities they were worried that there would be takeover by the federal government and they were not investing enough in these services, okay, in the communities. Now that the law now gave them the gave them the right, the exclusive authority to do that, do we see increase in investment? Okay. Now that they know that okay, there is no threat anymore. Now do they invest more in these communities? So what you have here, you have the total investment, okay, and you have the the source of uh, the investment, self-financing, loan and debt, and you have different outcomes here. So we have the total investment, and then where the investing uh, the fund funding come, comes from. Now I plot the selection biases. So the dots here that you see are actually the selection biases before the law was passed. If you look at that, the first graph here, right, the selection biases are not equal. If you pay attention, they are not equal anyway. So the previous period selection difference between the, the municipalities that are treated and that those who are not treated, you see actually that they are different. If you look at the size, it's 600 to 1,200,000, and that's the Brazilian bridge, okay? Which is kind of not zero, it's significant. But he just run the deep and deep anyway. So he, he basically assumed that the selection bias in the next period is just equal to the selection bias in 2005. And then kind of ignore what was happening before. So he ran the deep and deep, meaning that you are assuming the, the selection bias somehow the 2007 selection bias is just equal to the 2005 selection bias. That doesn't follow the pattern that we see, right? So what we're going to do is say, okay, this gives us the range for its possible selection biases. We're going to take that range and plot that in the, the equation and then get the range for the causal effect. Okay, so we recommend that if you have a data you plot this, you, you plot this kind of scatter plot. You look at the selection biases before the treatment happens. If they seem to be equal, great, you go with different view. If they are not, then you may want to use our approach. The next thing here yes. is that you don't need to choose anything. It's just the data gives you this range. Uh, I think I missed this a little bit earlier. How are you quantifying selection bias? It's the, it's the difference between the control and treatment group before the, the treatment happens, before the, the bill or the reform happens. Right. Uh, so these municipalities, yeah. like how, what, what, was it like half of them were given the right to uh, set their own yeah, water very good. Yes. structure? So, so some of the municipalities, what they were doing, they were contracting with the federal government. I see. So now that the, the, the law was passed, there is no threat for them. They were already contracting with the federal, so they're fine. They are the control group. The other municipalities are the treatment group. They were fearing that they would be taken over from the federal government. These are the treatment group. Yes. Great question. Yeah. yeah. Is good? So does this conditional on the exit, right? Yes. So like if you're, you're, yes. so, you're all so, of your controls and you're yeah. you're assuming those um those X's are constant over time. Is that so it's the same predictors that you 
no, the X is the X. That's a great question, actually. So the the it's possible. For example, you have population, you have income, GDP. Those are changing over time. Right. So our approach allow for allows for that. Okay. But usually, that's a great point I want to emphasize. Thank you. So usually, in the standard, if they are going to assume that the X's are not changing over time, if they allow the X's to change over time, you can no longer apply the standard. Our method is robust to that. We allow the X's to change over time. And, and yes, that's a great point. Yeah. So just to be clear, the data requirements are pretty high to have these previous periods. It's not just you know the education level in the previous periods. It's the education level plus populations, the you know all the other potential exits yes. yes. at these previous periods. Yes. So it's a high data demand. That's, that's right. So you need more information, right? Suppose that I only have one pre-treatment period. So that's not really telling me much, right? So more information is better. But at the same time, the region, right? If if the region is not stable and you have more information, then this region can become wider. And that's in terms of identifying power, it will give you something that's not that useful. Because if the region keeps increasing with the size of the data that you have. So there is that why we say there is some kind of stability about that region. The more data is, is good. But sometimes that, that's, that's why there is a trade of you need an information mm -hmm. to do this. Yeah. So, so these are different dependent variables. Yes. So, so the selection bias that you're measuring is just the difference in the, the predicted errors. Yes. It's, it's, yes, you can, see, you can see that way. Mm -hmm. So if you remove the, the observed covariate, it's like the remaining. You see the difference right, between right. the control and treatment okay. yes. And this is just different. This is not different X's. This is different Y's. Yes, different Y's between right. the treatment group and control right. group. The municipalities that are treated and those who are not treated. Yes. 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 So that's why we say that before the treatment happens, they are already different. If you just ignore this difference, you have that bias in your estimate. Right. So you cannot interpret that. I came in about five minutes late, so I don't think you're going to get to it, but. Are you at the end of the day going to show essentially a comparative interrupted time series and if the differences are on a trend or a range of possible values using these mins and maxes here as the yeah, as yeah, the counterfactual? Yeah, is that yeah, essentially what the yeah, yeah. What that, the method that's shows? essentially what we're doing. So okay. we're going to show the range of possible values. We don't know. So for example, here, this is interesting because it seems to show a pattern, right? In this case, you may want to forecast to kind of fit the line. So you do CITS for and that then, one. Yes. The other one, do yeah. the other one is kind of, yeah, all over the place. Please yeah. point, yeah. Yeah. Are any other questions? So now what, what I'm going to discuss is actually, I'm going to keep, so it, I mean, in, in, intuitively, what kind of situations you may have when you would, you would think that this set of bias will be stable over time, right? That's the question you may, you may ask. So let me skip this uh, theoretical thing and then show you this picture. So in, in economics, there is a, in labor economics, there is some, there's something called Ashen filters D. So the, the idea is that if you want to, if the treatment variable is a training program, so you want to train people to give them higher chances of getting, higher chances of getting the job. If we, it, usually people who participate in those programs, there are people who have been experiencing a decline in the earning right before they participate, right? Someone who is struggling will say, okay, I'm going to take this program to see if that will improve my chances of getting a job or if that will increase my earning, right? So because of that, you see that usually the, it's like the treatment, the treatment and control group, right? The US, I, here maybe it's not a good example, but people who are experiencing a decline in the earnings, right? And the control group may not experience anything that so people who's, who have stable jobs, they're okay, they're fine. But you see that even in this case, the parallel trend will not hold because people who actually participate in the program, they have been experiencing a decline in their earnings already. So in such a case, you cannot use the standard definition. So that was pointed out by Ashen Peter in 1978, a long time ago. So it's like in that case, parallel trend phase. But yet people are still using different diff, even if they want to measure, for example, a pet of minimum wage, because they don't have other robust alternatives. 
So what they were proposing is how can you kind of in distribution control for distillation bias in a robust way. So in the case like this, you see that next period when they participate in the um, uh, the program, now that you can see next period, you see the employment will start increasing. Okay, so it's like you have a shock in the in the earnings, but that shock was just transitory. So in the case like that, parallel trend will not hold, but the bias set, the set of the bias will be stable over time. Okay, so this is a, a natural example where we have that. So in the example that I showed, so basically what the identify set of the causal effect looks like, what, what do the set that I get for the causal effect, what does that look like? So we have assumed that here it's like the theta is the causal effect. It's changing from 10 minus 10 to 10. So depending on the value of the, the theta here, we can see that the, the sets can be informative or may not be informative, right? So if you are here, we can decide the lower bound and the upper bound is kind of telling you that, oh, the effect is negative, okay, if you are in this region. Or if you are in the, this region, the effect is kind of positive. But if you are here, somewhere here, you don't know. But why is this informative? Even if you don't, you cannot sign the causal effect. If you just run the standard diff and diff here, it will tell you that the causal, the true causal effect is positive because it's above zero, zero. Okay, so the standard diff and diff will give you this number. But the approach that we are proposing will tell you that it's between this number and this number, which means that you cannot tell whether it's positive or negative. Okay, that's kind of bad news. But it's good news in the sense that this one will tell you wrongly that the true effect is positive while it's actually negative, right? The diff in diff will give you the wrong direction, but our approach will say we don't know, right? Sometimes it's better to say we don't know than just giving the wrong conclusion. Okay. Yes. So what's the? Is it like a uniform distribution? Or sorry, are you assuming? Like what is? What yeah, is so, it? So yeah, good question. So we are assuming that we have a DGP like this, and the theta is kind of changing up between minus ten and ten. So this is kind of yeah we construct this data to uh, just to show how the the region can change depending right. on the true value. Right, but so in addition to the bounds, though, you could say like if you you are like putting a distribution on that those biases. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That that's a great question. So we explore that in the paper. So if you kind of want to know the distribution of the bias, so you put the distribution of the bias. If you believe in that. Then you can look at the average bias given that distribution. You just know the region and then you put the distribution. You can compute the expected bias and then use the expected bias instead of the range. We call that policy oriented generalized diff and diff because that's useful for policy, but it may not be equal to the true causal effect, right? Because the true causal effect may not be equal to the average, the bias may not be equal to the average. But you can do that for policy uh, uh, relevant questions. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So we gave it a different note. We say policy oriented differently. Any other questions? So this, this model is kind of a popular model. So we call it linear uh, individual specific linear trend. Usually, sometimes when you have a data like of time period and then you have also a cross sectional, people just include like an individual specific trend. To remove the bias is also a way to say, okay, I know that my parallel trend is violated, but I'm going to try to use that specification to control for the bias, right? So if you are in a situation like that, that's the case that I show where the bias is increasing. Okay, you see the pre-treatment period minus two, minus one, and zero. So you see the bias is increasing. So the set is not stable, right? But here you can just predict the next period by just joining the lines here and get the next period duration bias, which gives you this. Then you go back and take this value, you prop that in the equation, and then you correct for the bias. So sometimes, if you know, like for example, in this case, you say, okay, the bias is increasing, it's like you are using the individual specific linear trend, you can model that. So it, it's really the case that you just need to let the data speak and tell you what to do, okay? 
So I'm going. I'm not going to talk about this a lot. It's technical, but here is the idea: how we now construct confidence bounds, right? Usually, you have the point. Now, because of sampling errors, you want to know how do I control for this uncertainty due to the sampling error. Basically, people, what we are recommending here is when you want to run deep and deep, you need the baseline period and you need the treatment period, two periods. Now that you have multiple pre-treatment period, what we recommend is you use the first one with the current period, you run the standard diff and diff, you get the confidence intervals from Stata or whatever software you are using. You drop the one of the pre-treatment period, you use the next one. So basically, if I go back here, usually I use period zero and period one to run the standard diff and diff. Okay, and then I get the confidence intervals. So what we are suggesting, you do that, and then you drop the zero, you take minus one and one. You run the same regression, you get the confidence intervals. Now you drop minus one, and then you take minus two and one. You run the same regression. Then you take the union of all these confidence intervals that you are getting. So pretty simple to implement in software. You, it, it doesn't require anything beyond the standard diff and diff. You just run multiple diff and diff, and then take the region that you get from these different different groups. Okay, any questions on this? That's the implementation. Yeah. You've talked about a lot, like letting your data talk, but at what point are you just seeing like it, their bias is increasing so much that these two groups of people are fundamentally different? And what, how, how do you like work with that? Yeah, so I think they let me go to the application again. So here, right? That's a great question. So how do I know, like, uh, how, what specification can I use for the bias? How do I know that? If I have fewer data, maybe I cannot say anything. Suppose I only have these two data points, right? And then I didn't have this. So should I say that it's increasing or it's, it's just this region? So that's kind of the question she's asking. How do I know that? If I only have two data, it's, I can say, okay, I'm going to draw this line. Right, and then fit the next period that will be wrong. Or I will say that it's just here. So that you need the lot of you need the data that comes with that. So more information will show you the pattern. So basically, yes, you, if you don't have a lot of data, then the method is not that robust. Right. So you want to be robust, so you need data to kind of see the pattern. If you don't see any pattern, then you take the you know, set. Yeah, that's a great point. So you need information. Okay, and you get that from the pre-treatment period. You can also use some covariates to kind of get the regions. Like if you look at the selection bias for females, the selection bias for males, and then they are different, right? That also giving you some information about the difference in terms of selection bias. Okay. Okay. How often is the parallel trends just using two data points? Because they might use two data points and it might look parallel, but then like the next point is missing. I mean, so how often is that happening? And maybe it, that's not robust either. Yes, that's a great point. It, actually, people use that all over the time. Mm -hmm. They don't care about, <laughs> about the, whether the assumption is not uh, plausible or not. They, they, they just go with parallel trend. So that's a great point. So our approach will be more robust to the standard one regardless whether you have more data or not, because it gives you more information compared to what the parallel frame will do. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So with the uh, suggestion you're giving, at the end you're gonna have various confidence intervals when you use, uh, when you substitute the baseline with the previous points. Are you suggesting then to use like the mean and the max yes. of the confidence exactly. intervals you yes. get? Yes. Okay. Exactly. That is exactly the point. So you get these different confidence intervals, then you use the mean and the max. Mm -hmm. That's simple. So you get the set. Yeah. So it's like you are running the same diff and diff, right? Multiple times. You get that. So it's less, the approach is less costly, right? It's not, it's, it's like basically the same cost as diff and diff in terms of computation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know how computationally intensive it would be, but could you use bootstrapping to get confidence intervals? Yeah, we did that here in the application. When we, we take now a uh, covariate, right? We, I was saying in the beginning that we assume that we remove them. But actually, when you use them, sometimes people just use covariate in a linear way. 
the characteristic, they put it like a linear regression. But the effect can change from one covariate to the other, right? If it's age, for example, the effect may not be the same for younger people compared to the older people. So the standard approach, usually they kind of show it's the same for everybody so in, in a linear way, right? Our approach, we don't do that. We do what we what is called the doubly robust. We kind of try to be robust to miss specification. And for that, we use the bootstrap to, to get the confidence in the robust. Yes. What are your suggestions for dealing with different time intervals between data points in the pretreatment period? So for example, here you have data for, you know, all of these are one year intervals, but if you had data for 10 years before, eight years before, four and one years before, what, what do you suggest? Doing? So, I have to say that I'm impressed with the questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is great because uh, usually I don't, I don't because the audience is broad, I wasn't expecting that. But this is a great question. So, like here, look at here. So his question is, if I only look at the, the data point minus one, zero, and one, then I, I have kind of the same interval. But if I look at minus 0 0.5, then the interval is different. Like think about yearly data, if you look at minus one, zero, and one, then somehow you have semestral data. So you have minus 0 0.5 now and 0 0.5. So if it's not the case, what happens? So actually, that's the way how we justify that people, when they think about parallel trend, they need to look at, the, regardless of the, the frequency of the data, you need to think about that, oh, I'm assuming that I have parallel trend. Because if I don't have parallel trend, like in this case, the sequence, right, the, the standard diff and diff breaks down. It doesn't work. Our approach will be robust to that. Like here, if I, somehow now I have all this, all of a sudden I have semestral data, as long as you include this in the information, you show that, then you will be fine with our approach. That's a great question. Yeah. How many time points do you need to discover a pattern? That's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. So how? How many data points do I need to discover? But that, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> so that's why I say if you can get information, but more information is should be always be good. Yeah. But it's costly sometimes when you get information. So yeah, I think uh, I'm kind of running out of time, but uh, let me go quickly to the application, what we get from the application that I was showing you before. So this is the, when we compute the, the region, right, the bounds. So the blue here is the lower and upper bound for the different outcomes. And these are the values that the author gets from his paper, I mean, the published paper, okay? You see it's 2,000, I mean, almost 3,000, which is like 3 million Brazilian view. But our approach suggests that there's no improvement in investment. It was getting three million. Wait, show me, show, wait, 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 I'm confused. This is the the treatment effect of data. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the treatment effect. So we don't know the true value, right? We say, okay, because of the this difference in selection biases that we see, the region is here. The true value is somewhere here. It shouldn't minus so three. That's what the robust difference in difference. Yes. yes. The tau is the just Plain difference in difference. The tau, yes, the tau is uh, the is the, is uh, okay. It's uh, we need to compute this with the covariates. Use the W robust that I was talking about and do the bootstrap. When we do that, that's kind of take the difference, the, the naive difference between the treatment and control group, controlling for the, with, for the covariate. So the tau is like OLS, but you control for the covariate. Right, but why is their result so much larger? Because two things going on here. They assume that the bias is stable over time, which is not. And they also assume that the covariates okay, have the same effect, a linear effect. And variables like a population, uh, GDP are not changing over time. So a lot of things lead to this bias. So, but, your, but your bias, this is the lower bound and upper bound of your, of your bias is positive. Yeah, the bias, so the bias is, is always positive, even with your bounds. 
it but can be it can be negative so some of the, so some of this result is because of the time variant effect of the x's yes that's why you get yeah, yeah yeah that's right so the x's are driving this as well yeah right and also the bias is changing so the the bias is changing with the time and also across the x's yeah. yes so now let me show you another example. So in this example, the person was trying to look at the effect of insurance, whether farmers have insurance on the uh, the area of tobacco or the share of tobacco. So it's the farmers, they have some of them have insurance. So the government or some program provide them with insurance and some don't have. So if you ever run the standard DPND, that's the regression that you run. You run the the y variable the outcome on the post treatment period and then on the what the treatment variable and then the interaction term and this interaction term is all usually the, like the coefficient that you care about so that's how people run it right so the person run it here and i can show you the bias here it's here we only have three pre treatment period and then the bias are not equal now we do we see a pattern we don't know, it's uh, we only have three periods. So what we do, we just take the set that we get with this range, right? We just take the set, the mean and the max, and we plug that in the equation that I showed you in, in the beginning. And then, even though the bias were not equal, right? Our results, the, the region that we are getting is kind of delivering the same information that that person got before. So yes, if the difference in the biases is not huge, right, then you can still get with the robust bound, you will get similar information, which is okay. Meaning that it's always worth trying our approach because if there is no difference in the biases, we get the same thing as the different. Yeah. Was this study randomized? I thought it. Was no, no, no. It's not randomized. Okay. That's why the person is using the right. But they, I mean, sometimes they'll take. RCT data and run it. And run a different model, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. okay. I thought she did an experiment. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, but I think I think maybe she did the experiment, but there were no compliance or this okay. thing. She she worried she worried about selection. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think uh, this is uh, basically we propose a, a method that is kind of proposed to violation of parallel trend. And the selling point is like it costs you as much as you run with different people. You just need to run different people multiple times. And in, in the software, it's easy to do. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I really appreciate the question. Do you have code that does this? Yep. So we have currently with our code in state and R with the applications. We want to write a package. That we can send to Stata, and then Stata can incorporate that. And then publish it. That, that's only yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. There are other questions. Feel free. We all asked him during the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, y'all are welcome to stay here too and and meet Desiree for a little bit. We um, I don't think we have lunch plans until one thirty. We'll be around till one. Thank you. 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 Th